Some of you are really long ways away, and that's why I'm coming out here where I can get a little closer. I turned 40. I'm a little older than that now, but when I turned 40, my eyesight went to heck in a handbasket. So, and so I use readers if I have to, but uh, you know, some of you are way back there. But it's good to see you, and it's good to be seen. My name is David Bondurant. What's yours? <laughs> All right. I won't remember. That's why you're supposed to be wearing the name tags. That's what they told me. Um, there was a mother. She had two children. We were about four or six years old, and they were troublemakers. Any of you know anybody like that? <laughs> and these two boys, and why is it that we always identify the boys as the troublemakers? I, you know, I've known as many girl troublemakers as boys, but in this story, the troublemakers were boys. And they were into everything. If there was trouble, they could find it. In fact, if they couldn't find it, they made it. Well, one day, they got into real trouble. They destroyed the neighbor's flower garden. And the neighbor was mad. She brought the boys back over and Mom was very apologetic. She was, but there was nothing she could do. I mean, the flowers were destroyed. And she says, what am I going to do with these two boys? They're always in trouble. She says, well, let me tell you what I did. She says, when my boys were about that age, I took them to see the Catholic priest, and the Catholic priest had a little conversation with them, and they were fine. Sounds like a great idea. So the next morning, she grabs the two boys and she marches them down to the Catholic Church and in to the, see the priest. And she goes in first and she explains, and the priest says, not a problem with taking care of So he goes out and gets the six-year-old's hand and takes him, by the hand, takes him back into his office. And it's one of those big, dark kind of offices. And there's this big, overstuffed leather chair. But when he, when he said to the boy, sit here, it kind of swallowed him. Now, he was scared. And here was this man in his black collar, black shirt with a white collar, who's looking down at him this very stern voice. And he said, young man, where is God? Young man, where is God? Young man, I've asked you a question. Where is God? After the third time, the young man gets that frightened look in his face and he jumps up out of the chair. Runs out of the room. He grabs his little brother's hand and says, Tommy, you've got to get out of here. They've lost God and they're trying to pin it on us. <laughs> when I was in seminary, they told me I should start every sermon with a joke. That's as good as it gets. How many of you think that sometimes the church loses God. Okay, I can see this. We're going to have to have a little practice here. If you're here today, raise your right arm. Okay, if you're not here, raise your left hand. Don, you haven't been here all day. All right. We lose God. Sometimes we lose God in the busyness of life. And if you're busy, who's here busy? 
All right. So you're going to get used to it. One of the things that I've learned is that every time I get you to raise your hand, you know what happens? You remember what I'm saying. And if you've ever been to church, you know that you listen to the sermon and go, can't remember a thing he said. <laughs> Who here thinks that sometimes the church makes being a believer and being a disciple harder than it ought to be? Yeah. Who here thinks that the church sometimes gets in its own way. I have one more question. Who is here today that would like to know how to be a follower of Jesus in one, count them, one easy sentence? Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. Oh, thank you. Boy, I thought everybody had left. <laughs> One of the things you're going to learn is that I think sermons ought to be interactive. Sermons ought to be something that we do together. And that's why I have you raise your hands and nod your heads and say amen and say yes. And if you feel compelled to say amen, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> How many of you got eight hours of sleep last night? That, you know. So who's ready to hear the one sentence that all you have to do? All right. Repeat after me. Are you ready? Yes. All I have to do. All I have to do is laugh. All you have to do is laugh. All you have to do is laugh. Here, shake my hand. It makes me look better. Yeah. You know what? Now turn to a neighbor and say, All you have to do is laugh. All you have to do is laugh. My name is David Bonner, and you all know that you've been reading the newsletter for three or four weeks. My name's been all over it in those pages, and I'm really glad and excited to be here. Right. Is it okay if I spend a few minutes talking about who I am. Is it all right? Yes. All right. I am a lifelong member of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I grew up in the first Christian church of Hermiston, Oregon. I am the 21st Timothy of one pastor, which means I am the 21st person to go into the ministry under the tutelage of one Reverend Jack Now. I am here because God called me. I am here because the church I grew up in started teaching me about leading in worship when I was in third grade. That's when I can most easily remember it. I am here because every time I turned around, the pastor and his wife were asking me what I was going to do when I grew up. I learned to lie to the pastor. <laughs> said things like, you're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a mortician. That was my thing. <laughs> and they would just laugh at me and they'd say, no, you're not. You're going to be a preacher, just like Jack. I said, no, I'm going to be better than Jack. <laughs> I always said that to Jack's wife. Jack would not have taken it well. There are some things you should know, there are some things you need to know, and there are some things about me that you might not want to know, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I am the father of two amazing daughters. Rachel was 23, she got married last summer. She's happily married in Gurney, Illinois. I have a 17-year-old daughter, her name is Jay Lee, and she is, I will tell you, the apple of my eye. She is fabulous and wonderful, and she is so excited that I am here today. One of the reasons I almost did not become a pastor, I will tell you, is because of my daughter. I wanted to 
we closer to her. She lives just outside of Portland, Oregon, in Hillsborough, Oregon. This is not closer <laughs> to Hillsborough, Oregon, than Chicago. It's not all that much farther, but it's not closer. But I called her, and I said, Jay Lee, I have two possibilities I want to talk about them with you. And she said, Dad, it's no brain. The church in Texas is where God is home. Not that seventeen year old daughters. There are other people in my life that are important. Sheila, you've heard her. Christopher, you'll get to meet and know him more. There are some things that I want to share with you about who I am as a pastor. I am passionate about individual and church growth. I believe that the church should grow. I believe that every congregation should grow. I have yet to find a church that shouldn't grow. And we have a problem in America. 5,000 churches a month are closing. I don't know about you, that doesn't sound good. And it's not because all the people are saved. <laughs> See, I can get it. If everybody was saved, we could close those churches because we wouldn't need them. I'm passionate about evangelism and helping people change their lives. I am passionate about helping people become who God has called them to be. And it is not unlikely that I will look at someone and say, you know, God is calling you to do this. Or to do that. To go into the ministry. To do this or that. In God's name. It's not because I necessarily want to tell people what to do. Although I do rather enjoy that. <laughs> But I believe that God has called me to do that. That is a part of who God has called and prepared me to do and be. I believe that people, go ahead and take a look around. Look at people sitting next to you, close to you. Now look at people farther to the room from you because you sat where you were sitting because you didn't want to sit next to them. <laughs> that you all want good things to happen. How many of you would like something good to happen at First Christian Church in Duncanville? Yes. How many of you would like something great to happen at First Christian Church in Duncanville? Yes. One more. How many here today, thank you, sir, <laughs> would like something absolutely glorious to happen at First Christian Church in Duncanville? Okay, here's the good news and the bad news. If you only want something good to happen, it can happen because you're here. If you only want something even great to happen, it can happen because you are here. But if we want something really absolutely amazing and glorious to happen, it isn't going to be because you're here. It isn't going to be because I'm here. It's going to be because God has called us together to do great and wonderful things in His name, and then glorious things will happen. Amen. Amen. Anybody interested? Oh, yes. A couple of other things that you should know. I believe that every person, take your hand, your right hand, Take that pointer finger and push it into your chest. I believe that every person in this room, I believe that every person actually around has the power and ability to change their world. Right here. 
Because you change our world by changing us. And we do things in the church sometimes to really get in our own way. Sometimes we build up barriers and walls, never intentionally, at least not at First Christian Church in London, do we? To keep the good news from changing people's lives. Sometimes we do things that get in our way because we have rules. I have, I, I want you to know, I did ask today for a copy of the Constitution because every church has a Constitution. It's actually the rule book for how churches are supposed to live and do and be. The good news and bad news is your committee that stood up, your pulpit committee, they already know that I am a rule breaker. I'm going to tell you from the beginning, I believe relationships are more important than rules. Now, rules are important. Don't get me wrong. But if I have to choose between following a rule or building a relationship, I'm choosing the relationship every single time. Because I have a really good, good, good model to follow that. His name is Jesus. Amen. In the 28th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, beginning in the 18th verse, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. You heard Don read from Matthew 22 where it says, they got into a fight and they asked Jesus what the most important command was and he said, love God with your whole being and love your name. You know, those are really the only places where Jesus gave explicit, direct commands to the people. My theory is if we at First Christian Church in Duncanville can love God and love our neighbor and go make disciples, Great and glorious things are going to happen. But not without good planning. We're going to be about doing some serious planning at First Christian Church in Duncan. We're going to plan and plan and we're going to carry out plans and we're going to evaluate what we carried out so we can make new plans because planning. Let's God work within us. Because part of the plan is going to be opening our lives to God's leading. And that's when your change is going to happen. I learned early on in my ministry that it's a piece of paper. I learned that being the person God has called us to be is as simple as one thing, and that is learning how to laugh. Now I'm going to tell you, I spelled it wrong. L A F. Is it up there? No, it's not up there. Sometimes I put things up behind me, but it's in your bulletin. L A F. And the grammar teachers and the spell checkers said, Oh, they misspelled the word. No. It's really simple. The first letter is I. And that means that we have to learn to love. We have to learn to love God first. Love God first. Turn to a neighbor and say, love God first. Love God first. Let me tell you something. If you don't love God first, it doesn't matter who you love after. Not as a believer, not as a disciple. We have to love God first, and that means we have to be in an attitude of worship in our lives. We have to be ready to let God be God 
And that means sometimes we have to give up playing God. Because God hasn't died and left anybody in this room in charge. I don't know, because he would have called me first. <laughs> Maybe not. We have to love God first. And, and when we love God first, our lives are in the right position to be blessed. You all heard the command. It's, it's very clear. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your being. In other words, with everything that you are, love God. Love God. The second piece is, comes in the same passage. Not only did Jesus say you need to love God, but he says you need to love your neighbor. What does it mean to love your neighbor? How many of you have neighbors here in the room? You know, I can actually tell you that when I was growing up, I grew up on a little farm. My closest neighbor was eight miles away. We almost qualified for not having neighbors. Most of us have neighbors. Most of us have neighbors. Some of us can remember their names. Some of us have no clue what our neighbors' names are. But we're supposed to love them. So what does it mean to love your neighbor? Well, I'm going to give you one word. It starts with the letter A. And that word is by acceptance. My friends, we cannot change the world by forcing people to do what we want them to do. We cannot change the world by taking people aside and pushing and cramming and pulling so they fit into our box. We cannot do that in the church and call ourselves with integrity Christians and disciples of Christ. We have to accept people for who they are because you know what? They've been who they are all of their lives. Just like you've been who you are all of your life. And I guarantee you there's not one person here that started out in this perfect little box marked Christian. This is the box that sometimes we try to push and shove and get everybody into so we're all just alike. Well, I'm looking at this room and I'm not all alike. Go ahead, look around. Some of you look pretty scary. Those of you laughing the hardest, better be careful. We're all just a little bit different. And that's a good thing. That's a God thing. And that's how God things are going to happen here. We're going to take all of these different people we're not going to push and pull them into a box. We're going to take all the gifts and all the talents and all the skills and we're going to just knock out the walls. We're going to knock down the walls of our box. Because everywhere I've ever looked in Scripture, the church has never, 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 never in a box. It's been a living, moving, growing, life-changing organism. And you won't put that in a box. You set it free. And that's part of the universe. And so when people come to us, and we're going to attract, by the way, we're going to attract some people that don't look like us. Now you're looking at me and you're going, oh, thank God. I want you to know I used to look worse. I used to look 75 pounds heavy since March 19th. I've never gotten a, trans um, a transformation. I'm 75 pounds lighter today than I was March 19th. Now, did I do that just by thinking, Oh, I think I'll lose 75 pounds. No. I worked at it. Do you know how many cookies I passed up? <laughs> Do you know how much cheesecake 
cake I've missed out on? And chocolate. My wife is reminding me, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> My friends, transformation begins with acceptance. I had to accept the very fact that I was way overweight and then decide to do something about it. People are only going to come to know Jesus if we accept people for who they are, as they are, and offer them the transforming grace of salvation and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. There's no box to speak about. That's what it means to accept people. We need to say to the world, you are welcome in this place. You are welcome in our life. Because if we don't say it, they won't hear it. And there will be some people who won't believe you. So not only do we have to say it, we have to live it. Until we believe it. That's the integrity. By the way, part of accepting them, all those people out there that lose their son, part of accepting people in this world around us means that we have to go to them. We have to become part of people's lives. We have to make ourselves vulnerable being laughed at, or even ridiculed for our faith. It's been happening for a thousand years, two thousand years. As we learn to accept people, people are going to say, I know that place, I know that person, I know that they really are willing and able to accept who I am. And maybe what they're offering is something can change my life. So we have to love people, we have to accept people. And the third thing is we have to learn to forgive. Have you ever had any trouble forgiving people? Some of you aren't telling the truth. <laughs> any of you ever had trouble forgiving yourself? When I talk about forgiveness, yes, I want you to forgive the people that hurt you. I want you to set them free from your plain God in their life. Because when you don't forgive, what you're doing is saying, I'm God, and I'm not letting you go. And I'm not sure any of us are even my plain that time. But the second thing we have to do is we have to learn to forgive ourselves because if we don't forgive ourselves, we're condemning ourselves to a life filled with guilt. And you know, I've read the Bible from cover to cover multiple times. I've read Jesus, and there is almost never a command of Jesus saying, Go and be guilty. I dare you to show me my face. But what I can show you over and over again is go and be dead. Go and be set free. Go and sin no more. Go and be in a life of love and acceptance and forgiveness. My friends, as we begin our ministry together, I want you to know that as your pastor, I'm going to do my very best to help you learn 
จังหวะหัวเก่าตัวสักจะปิดมันจะปิดเยอะเพราะมันสอดเพราะมันเยอะมากแต่ว่าทุกคนทุกคนเห็นว่าสอด